Thank you so much. Well, so my name is Christopher Hess. I'm one of the movement source neurologists here. And so I was asked today to talk about fatigue because I, I previously I gave a talk on pain and fatigue in Parkinson's disease once as a national webinar for the Parkinson's Foundation about five or six years ago. And then again recently at one of our symposiums. Uh, and I think when I was talking to Amanda about what I would talk about this year at this most recent symposium, I was trying to think of what are the things that just about everybody with Parkinson's disease has and deals with, but nobody ever talks about. And so this was the reason why I came up with fatigue and Parkinson's disease. So we have about 10 slides or so to go through. It's not going to take a huge amount of time. There will be lots of time for Christmas partying. But uh, I wanted to try to talk about what fatigue is in Parkinson's disease, because it, it really is different. When you talk about fatigue, in Parkinson's disease, it's very different from fatigue that the general, uh, that a person who's of the same age would experience. I'm going to talk a little bit about how its frequency um, and other associated symptoms when in the course of the disease it occurs, and then most importantly, uh, treatment and what the treatment options are. The big thing that I'd like to have everybody take home as their sort of take home point today is. We all know that when you see your, your movement disorders neurologist, you've got a thousand things to talk about. Often you remember some of them on the drive home, right? Um, they have a thousand things they want to ask you about. There are, there are things that you can do if fatigue is an issue for you to sort of prep the conversation and reduce some of the education that they might have, not, might have to do ahead of time to allow you to focus on, are, are you both sort of talking about the same thing? So that's what what uh, I'll talk about a little bit today. So it's always good to start with a definition. So fatigue and Parkinson's disease, um, it, we define it as a state of extreme tiredness. Uh, it can be nonspecific weakness or exhaustion. Uh, it can be physical or uh, mental. And it doesn't have a true definition per se. Um, People, often when people talk about fatigue, they, they can mean a mental fatigue or a physical fatigue. And there's a difference between sleepiness and fatigue. And so I'll start by talking about, probably this is the, the take home, the, the thing that's most important is separating excessive daytime sleepiness from fatigue during the day. Those are two very, very different things. And if you walk in and tell your doctor, I'm sleepy, they're going to go down a certain mental path that might be a complete wrong direction compared to what you're actually experiencing. So when someone has the medical term of excessive daytime sleepiness, this is a person who feels throughout the day, or throughout most of the day, and sometimes it's all the time, sometimes it's periodic throughout the day, not so much that they feel overwhelmed by exhaustion, but just they're tired, they want to go to sleep, they feel like they need to go to sleep, they go and actually lay down or sit down and they immediately fall asleep, right? So that's what's called excessive daytime sleepiness. Some patients can have excessive daytime sleepiness all day long, right? You're just sleepy all day long. Other times, patients can have excessive daytime sleepiness that's dose-related. So one of the things that can happen with Parkinson's disease medications is you take your Cinemet, and it actually makes your motor symptoms better, but it immediately makes you feel, or within 30 minutes, makes you feel like you want to go to sleep, right? And so this is one of the problems that we have. We give you a pill, I can't decide where in your brain that chemical is going to go. It's going to go to your entire brain, even though I need it to go to a very specific place. So I get what I want in that it's going to the place that I need it to go to, but at the same time it's going to all these other places that I never intended it to. And so very often, the same thing that we're doing to help your motor symptoms of the disease is actually making your daytime sleepiness worse, right? So. When, you're, when your issue is excessive daytime sleepiness, there's a couple things that you're going to want to make sure that, that you have straight in your head and make it easier for your clinician because the earlier you get a sense of what it is that's going on, the longer you have to talk about what your treatment options are. And that's what you really want to do, right? You want to know, what can I do about this? What are the options? And very often, it's not going to be a straightforward answer. It's not like a car where something goes wrong and you just do the repair. It's the same for every car. In each situation, there's going to be a give and take. There's going to be things that are potentially beneficial, and there's going to be downsides to anything that you do. And that's where your doctor uh, should give you a, a, a breadth of options of, of things that you could potentially do. 
and then help you to decide which option might be best for you. So we talked about the patient who's sleepy all day long. We talked about the patient who has sleepiness related to uh, their doses. Every time they take Cinemet, they feel like they have to go take a nap. There's also patients who are sleepy most commonly just in the afternoon. So you wake up, you're doing okay, you take your first dose, you're turning on, things are working okay. But right around one o'clock, you're feeling like you just are having trouble getting through the day. This is one thing that commonly happens. That doesn't mean that something's wrong with your medication. That doesn't mean that um, you're having problems sleeping at night. It could, but it doesn't automatically mean that. Uh, in many patients, that's just what happens with Parkinson's disease. Your brain, when you have Parkinson's disease, is processing information at a much higher level, and it's requiring a lot more processing than it normally would for someone without Parkinson's disease. And any of you who ever driven and followed directions or talked on the phone as you were doing something else with Parkinson's disease, no. Anytime you're doing more than one thing at once, where 20 years ago it might not have been a big deal, suddenly everything starts to fall apart when you have Parkinson's disease. It's a lot more difficult to do multiple things at a time. So um, it's important to keep in mind that if you need a nap in the afternoon between 1 and 3 o'clock, that's a good thing. That's not something you should feel bad about. That should be a tool that you can use to give yourself a recharge. Because um, taking a nap at that time period, not only can it make you more productive for the rest of the day, but it can actually improve your symptoms for the rest of the day. So always important to remember, there's absolutely nothing wrong with taking a nap in the afternoon sometime between 1 and 3 o'clock. People usually do a half an hour to 45 minutes. You can sort of adjust it, because if you take too long of a nap, you're going to feel groggy afterwards, right? If you take too short of a nap when you wake up, uh, you might not actually get the benefit from it. So it's important to not uh, have uh, reticence to taking a nap in the afternoon if you need it, because it's a very common thing for people who have uh, excessive daytime sleepiness. So if you determine, um, and you, you, as we're talking about this, some of you may say to yourself, well, yeah, that's me, I think I have excessive daytime sleepiness. So what are the causes, the things that could be addressed that are contributing to that? So we already mentioned one is your medicine, right? For most patients, we don't want to take away your carbidopal levodopa Cinnamon, because we know that your daytime sleepiness might get better, but your motor symptoms are going to get worse. And so I'll talk a little bit more about what the, 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 the treatments for that might be. But the first thing that you have to think of when you're dealing with excessive daytime sleepiness is, is there a sleep problem overnight? So sleep disruption in Parkinson's disease patients is extremely common, and there's lots of things that can give rise to it. So if you have Parkinson's oh, disease I'm so and sorry. you are um, in your 70s, Hello? you may get up to go to the bathroom four or five times in the time. And after you get up and you lay down, you might experience tremor. And the tremor might be wait, wait, wait. from falling asleep right away. Or you might use the restroom and go to lay down again and your mind starts racing. You get racing thoughts. And that's a very common thing for people who have Parkinson's disease. That's another reason why uh, people sometimes will have poor sleep at night. Patients with Parkinson's disease have REM sleep behavior disorder. There's a certain part of your brain that's supposed to paralyze you when you sleep. And this is something that's happened over time. It happens in all mammals. And you can imagine why it would be genetically beneficial to have you not acting out your dreams. Because dreams are something that all of us have to have. If we are out, if, if thousands of years ago we were out acting out our dreams in the woods, we would never survive long enough to pass our genes down to the next generation, right? So everybody. Uh, has a part of your brain that actively paralyzes you except for your eyeballs which move during REM sleep. Uh, during sleep. With Parkinson's disease, that part of your brain is not working normally, right? So if you have Parkinson's disease and you fall asleep, and as soon as you get to the point where you're in a dream state, you move, what's going to happen? You're going to wake up and you're going to start to fall back asleep again. And as soon as you get to the dream state, you're going to move and you're going to wake up. So rather than moving in a nice, normal way through all the stages of sleep, you're going to REM and then, and then to a more shallow stage, to REM and a more shallow stage. And you can wake up in the morning and feel like you never went to sleep. You're just as tired as you were when you first went to bed at night. And that can be from one REM sleep disorder. So one of the things that you can do to get a sense of if that's happening to you, if you're falling out of bed, you're waking up and you're on the floor, there's a good chance you have REM sleep disorder. If you are swinging your arm, kicking, 
fighting your spouse laying in the bed next to you, you have REM sleep behavior disorder. Sometimes it can be as mild as just calling out in your sleep. Um, and usually these symptoms will develop years before the actual uh, <coughs> of Parkinson's disease can occur. So it's really important that if you do have REM sleep behavior disorder, you talk to your, your doctor about it because there are things that we can do. So melatonin has been shown to work in clinical trials. Patients who don't respond to melatonin clonazepam sometimes can be helpful. And so it can help to keep that part of your brain that keeps you paralyzed when you're, when you're sleeping. It sort of puts you in a deeper stage of sleep and prevents the movements from occurring. And it also uh, solidifies your sleep. So a lot of times patients with Parkinson's disease will have fragmented sleep. And it helps to sort of consolidate your sleep in a longer period of time. The other thing that can sometimes happen is Let's say you're not having REM sleep behavior disorder and you're taking daytime doses of cinnamon. You take your last dose at 6 p.m. and by 2 in the morning, everybody tosses and turns a little bit overnight. And you don't actually wake up completely when this happens, but um, you'll often move in your sleep as you go to a more shallow stage of sleep. If suddenly you're very rigid and it becomes very difficult for you to turn over, then you're going to actually wake up for real, not just, just turn in a, in, a, in a shallow stage of sleep. And sometimes it can be difficult to get back to sleep. So in those situations, your problem might be, so we talked about, it, could the problem be excessive daytime or uh, REM sleep behavior disorder? Maybe the problem is that you're wearing off overnight, and you, uh, are, when you go to turn over, it's so difficult for you to do that it's waking you up. And so one option that you can do is you can put on silk or satin pajamas. And if that doesn't work and it's still hard for you to turn over in bed, you can use silk or satin sheets and silk or satin pajamas. Then when you go to turn, going, right? <laughs> really but if you're experiencing rigidity that's making it difficult for you to turn over in bed at night, that's a great way to make it a little bit easier and it, you might notice an improvement in your quality of sleep. Some of you might snore, right? So um, people, lots of people without Parkinson's disease in the same age group also have obstructive sleep apnea or other causes for sleep apnea. So getting a sleep evaluation through your primary care doctor can be a really good idea. Uh, just to make sure that there's not something uh, that's not specific to Parkinson's disease that's going on as well. So, uh, we talked about REM sleep behavior problems, we talked about wearing off at night, uh, we talked about symptoms coming back. Uh, that probably covers most of the sleep related issues that the incontinence is, because, or not so much incontinence, but the urge to have to urinate, having to get up four or five times. Sometimes what people will do is they'll take a cutoff time, 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. They'll make sure they stay well hydrated during the day, but at 6 or 7 p.m. they stop having fluids after that. And that can sometimes help to make sure that you're not, not having as many urinary episodes overnight. So that's something that can help as well. The other thing to keep in mind, too, is if you're the type of person who, when you wake up overnight, you're off or you're having a difficult time getting around, it's a very, very high risk time for falls. So it might be worthwhile to consider having a bedside commode or a bedside urinal that you can use. It's tough for people to get used to using that type of thing, but it is an option for many people if, if there's an increased period of time or an increased risk during the time the overnight that you're trying to get to the bathroom. That can be particularly important if you're taking any medications to help you sleep. As you can imagine, if you take clonazepam or Ambien or any of these medications, even Trazodone to help you sleep at night, you sleep through most of the side effects that could be occurring might not realize that it's affecting your balance. And so if you're not cognizant of the fact that any medications that, they're good, that, that your provider is giving you overnight to help you sleep might also make it more difficult for you to walk, you're going to be an increased risk for fall. So that's just something to, to keep in mind as well. Okay, so um, that covers the excessive daytime sleepiness. So you all should have a sense of if you Go to see your provider and, and they say, so how things are going? And you say, I'm sleepy during the day. This means something very different than fatigue, right? So now let's talk about fatigue. So let's say you have Parkinson's disease. You were diagnosed four years ago. You wake up in the morning. You feel relatively refreshed. You're still working. And four, four hours into your work day, you feel like you've run a mile and taken the SATs back in high school all at the same time. You're completely and totally overwhelmed. And so you go and you lay down and you don't fall asleep. And you don't fall asleep because you're not sleeping. The problem is you have fatigue. 
So the fatigue that someone without the Parkinson's disease experiences is very different than the profound fatigue that someone with Parkinson's disease experiences. You can feel like, as I said, like, like you put forth a dramatic effort, both mentally and physically, to do the regular activities that you might do in a day. And especially in, when, you, when you do things that involve dual tasking, you do more than one thing at a time. Anytime you're dual tasking, this is high risk anyway. If you're trying to do something on the phone and, and walk, or if you're paying attention to the directions, or even having a conversation and driving, or even talking on the phone while you're cooking, all these things where a, a normal person who doesn't have Parkinson's disease is not going to have too much difficulty. With Parkinson's disease, you might function very, very well, but things will break down when you start dual tasking. And so that's the fatigue that typically can happen. Patients can have mental fatigue associated with Parkinson's disease. You can have physical fatigue, or it can be both. And one of the things that you may find is it can be very much stress dependent. So you might find that on days when you're not very active, when you're relaxing at home, you do pretty well. Where on days when you are particularly stressed, some, something causes a stress response, within an hour or two, you feel like you're completely overwhelmed and you just need to stop. Mm -hmm. So that's probably the take home uh, to make sure that you know what the difference is between fatigue and excessive daytime sleepiness. So now, uh, you're all educated on that, and when you go to see your provider, if you're experiencing one or the other, you'll be able to walk in the door and start the conversation with the right uh, phenomenon that's happening, rather than having to go back and forth to see if you can identify what, the, uh, what it is that's occurring. So, it's estimated that up to 50% of patients have fatigue. Again, this is this overwhelming feeling, either mental or physical, of, uh, of just not having any more energy. Uh, that rate of, or that frequency, is about the same as people who experience pain in Parkinson's disease, which I've talked about before in the past. Interestingly, the fatigue can be the most disabling symptom. I can't tell you how many times I have patients who, I can control their motor symptoms of the disease, I cannot get control of, the, of their fatigue, and it can be very, very, very difficult for us to, uh, to control. As I mentioned, it can happen before the motor symptoms uh, occur, uh, and it can be very different on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, it can be different, as I mentioned, how much stress you're under, how much activity you're doing, how much you're exercising. It can even be affected by what your mood is. So if you're having a period of time where your mood is a little bit decreased, or you're a little bit depressed, or a little bit apathetic, uh, you can actually feel more fatigued, even though your, your uh, physical activity or your mental activity uh, has not really changed that much. So it's something to keep in mind. It's not true that um, Fatigue is not there in the beginning of the disease, and then it just gets worse as it goes on. For some patients, it can be there as one of the presenting symptoms of the disease, and then go away over time. For some patients, it's not there in the beginning, and then it happens when you start taking carbidopa levodopa. For other patients, it does just, it starts and then it just gradually worsens over time. For some patients, it's there all the time. No matter what you do every day, it's something that you're having to deal with. And for other patients, it's intermittent, it comes and goes. Um, I mentioned the apathy component of this, most of you, your provider, should talk to you about apathy. But apathy is something that's super important uh, in Parkinson's disease, and it's related in some ways to fatigue because some of the patients with Parkinson's disease will find that activities that they normally find rewarding or enjoyable just don't have the same reward to them. Uh, food can sometimes be less rewarding. So when you're experiencing apathy, it's important to discuss that with your clinician because apathy can sometimes be experienced as fatigue as well. So something to keep, uh, to keep in mind. So we talked about the differentiation between fatigue and excessive daytime sleepiness and how this is one of the most important things. Um, treatments. Okay. So one of the easiest things that you can do if you're experiencing excessive daytime sleepiness during the day is to institute a regular nap during the day, as we said, sometime between 1 and 3 o'clock. Super easy to do, right? Next thing that you can do if you're experiencing excessive daytime sleepiness is to address what's happening overnight. If you have any of those issues that I mentioned that occur overnight, talk to your, you can talk to your primary care about them. Sometimes they can uh, send you for a sleep study. You can also talk to your movement disorders neurologist about it, about the positives and negatives to consider taking a medication. Um, I mentioned two of the ones that we sometimes will use for REM sleep behavior disorder. Uh, sometimes patients will use what's called tricyclic antidepressants or medications like trazodone. Uh, uh, 
So all of those medications can be helpful as well. Sometimes increasing your exercise can be really helpful with getting rid of fatigue. So one thing that patients will notice is if you get a really good exercise regimen and then you go on a trip or you have family visiting or something happens and you get off your regular cycle and then suddenly you feel miserable, even after a day or two. So keeping in mind that sometimes um, changes to your regular cycle can, uh, can trigger periods of fatigue is, is important as well. So some of the medications that we can use. Um, so one favorite of mine is selegiline. So selegiline and risagiline, uh, as like the other name for risagiline, are MAOB inhibitors. MAOB is monoamine oxidase type 2 inhibitors. So these are just medications that increase the amount of dopamine in your brain. So risagiline, Azelect, is a newer medication. They're both relevant. They've been, both been on the market for a long time now, but it's a little bit newer and it's a little bit more pure of a drug. It doesn't have as many metabolites. <coughs> but one thing that does occur with selegiline, which is a twice a day medication, is when it gets processed through your body, it makes a very, very small amount of amphetamine as a byproduct. And it's no different than actually taking oral amphetamine, a very, very small amount. So what I often will do in patients who have fatigue, who I think can tolerate the medication, is I'll start selegiline, have them take it in the morning, and then take it at lunch. You should also, if you're on that medication, you should never be taking your dose past, let's say, 1 or 2 o'clock. And the effect is you have a little bit of amphetamine in your system that actually gives you a little bit of pep, and it can make people, it can help with excessive daytime sleepiness for some patients, and for some patients it can help with fatigue as well. But it's definitely an option to consider trying. Um, dopamine agonists for, the, for some patients can be helpful for fatigue. There's been some studies that have suggested that they can be helpful, but there's a lot of downsides to dopamine agonists as well. So that's going to be a complicated conversation you're going to need to have with movement disorder neurologist about whether that might be an option for you. Um, changes in your levodopa is another option. So there are some patients who I see that uh, do better on a day-to-day -day basis under dose than if they were perfectly dosed on their levodopa because they're getting so much either sleepiness or fatigue from the medication. So if, if I bring you in and I have you on, let's say, two and a half pills three times a day, and from a motor uh, uh, exam standpoint, you look perfect. But when you're not in the office, you're sleeping all day long and you're miserable sitting in the chair. But if I have you at, at two tablets instead of two and a half, but you're doing more and you're more active, even though your exam would be worse for me, I'm not helping you by making your exam better for me. I, my goal has to be to improve your quality of life on a day-to-day -day basis. And that may mean making some adjustments and, and, and having a, a motor exam that's not quite ideal for the purpose of improving other things. So uh, adjusting your levodopa is an option. So methylphenidate is another medication that's an option. This is, this is, in the, in the, this is a type of uh, amphetamine. Uh, so you have to be careful with this. It has some cardiovascular issues. If you have problems with memory and thinking, it can also be difficult if you have problems with anxiety. But for some patients, it can work very well as a controlled substance. So that'll be a, a discussion you have to have with your, your uh, neurologist. Modafinil is another medication. So it's provigil. It, it works in a little bit of a different way. It's not as uh, habit forming and it doesn't have the same degree of risks, but patients can have side effects as well to modafinil. So, this is the provigil, the medication that was developed for people who do shift work. It can be helpful in some patients. Uh, it really is patient specific, so you have to talk about it with your, your care provider. Deep brain stimulation is difficult because it's very variable. We've had patients who have significant fatigue and their fatigue gets better when they have DBS and other times patients who um, have significant fatigue and it just doesn't change. It's exactly the same way as it was, as it was before. So important to keep in mind, DBS is not going to be a reliable solution. It's great if it happens to help you, but it's not a reliable solution for helping with fatigue and excessive daytime sleepiness. And we are not sophisticated enough now to know who's going to get better and who's not, who gets, who goes forward and gets uh, the DBS surgery. So our goal uh, is to try to, and this is the goal of, of every movement disorders neurologist every time that I see you or if, that one of us sees you. Um, we're going to ask you a whole bunch of questions and we're going to ask you what questions you have for us. How can we control your symptoms in a way that's going to improve your quality of life on a day-to-day -day basis? And so anytime you have uh, an appointment with your neurologist, you should walk in the door knowing, because they're going to have a whole bunch of stuff they're going to want to talk to you about, but you should walk in the door knowing, what is my biggest problem right now? Is 
it's my second biggest problem right now. Have an agenda of the stuff that you want to talk about and mention it early because if you wait till the end of the visit to mention it, there might not be time left to go into it in detail. And if it is uh, one of the things that we talked about today, primarily excessive daytime sleepiness and fatigue, do your best to get a sense of which of those two it is uh, just based on the stuff that we talked about today and then you'll have more time to come up with potential solutions and things you can try. So thanks for listening, everyone. I'm happy to take questions if you, uh, if you have any. Any questions you'd like to ask? Anybody? Questions? It's almost a general question. How does hydration affect fatigue? Mm -hmm. It's a really good question, right? So, so why do patients with Parkinson's disease get dehydrated? One of the reasons is the autonomic nervous system that controls the the size of the blood vessels doesn't work the normal way as it does in people without Parkinson's disease. And so that can affect, although it doesn't directly affect your hydration level, it can have some of the same effects as, as disordered hydration. Most people with Parkinson's disease have urinary urgency. And so people are, whether they intend to or not, dehydrating themselves because they're just sick and tired of running to the bathroom all the time. So one of the things that can happen with dehydration is if you don't have enough fluid volume then your heart is going to have a difficult time pumping the blood up to your brain. And all of us who've ever had a nice, big, large Thanksgiving dinner knows, you feel tired right afterwards, right? Because all your blood is rushing to your gastrointestinal system to try to process all this great-tasting food that you just had. And it's a lot, you don't get as much and clear blood flow going up to the brain. So if you're dehydrated on a day-to-day -day basis, not only are you at risk of passing out, but you're also going to find that your cognition is not going to be, uh, you're not going to be as clear cognitively as you normally would be, and you may be experiencing a good amount of fatigue. But it's not true fatigue, it's due to the hypovolemia. So it is an important factor, uh, and, and it's, it can be a thing that can mimic the excessive daytime sleepiness of the person. What is the attitude that you have towards melatonin to take as a supplement? I think so melatonin is a, an over the counter supplement that, that is basically a hormone that you're. That meal a gland in your brain makes. Uh, it's relatively safe. Uh, it actually works for excessive daytime sleepiness. Most patients tolerate it very, very well. Usually, you need usually at least 6 milligrams, and then maybe up to 10 or 12 is probably where people stop at. I usually use 6 to 8 milligrams, depending on the size of the gummies or the pill. Uh, most patients will either find it works great, or it doesn't do anything that's noticeable to them, but I very rarely have patients who have problems with it. So it's a very safe and reasonable thing to try that you can get over the counter, it's very easy to do, and it may prevent your uh, neurologist from having to prescribe a more uh, strong medication that can have side effects of risk. Any other questions? I, I know you mentioned that you can cut off drinking the fluids uh, earlier on. Um, in your expertise, is that, is that a good idea, or is it better to just keep it kind of level? So if, if you're waking up four and five times a night as you urinate, it will work if you are, eight for most people, it will work if you're able to stay well hydrated during the day. So if you don't ever actually get to a state of good hydration during the day, and then you cut your fluids off at 6 p.m., you may pass out if you stand up overnight. But if you do a good job of staying well hydrated during the day, and start with, the, start with your bedtime, and then move it back a half an hour, and then move it back a half an hour from that, and just slowly, gradually move it back, and that's your best way to, if you do have problems, it can be little problems, it can make a small change.